Love is in the air. Being talked about. Being hoped for. And I couldn't help but think of you. And I just wanted to let you know how much you mean to me. Before I met you, my life was empty. I started to wonder if anyone out there noticed me. And then when you came into the picture, everything started to change. When I heard how majestic you were, I thought it couldn't be possible. Beauty no words could describe. Splendor only fit for the highest royalty. I started looking for flaws in you because, well, I thought you were too good to be true. How could someone like you care about someone like me? And yet there you were, ready and willing to accept me with all my flaws and failures, ready to risk your reputation to be associated with me. And that's what I love about you. I know I don't say it much. I know I don't show it enough. I know I put other things before and above you. I know sometimes I forget to honor you the way you deserve to be honored. But I know I've been bought with a price that I can never repay. I know I'm a sinner saved by your grace. So for all the times that I haven't said it and should have, may this stand as a letter of intention. I love you. I'm sorry for forgetting you. Forgive me for choosing anything over you. Help me see human love is a reflection and symbol of the perfect love only you have for me. My first love. the world, but it couldn't fail me, man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough, and you came along and put me back together.
nothing is impossible for our God. Oh, he is a great God. Great is his faithfulness, his mercy, his kindness. Father, right now, we just take the time to love on you, to acknowledge, Lord God, your goodness, your faithfulness towards us. Even when it seems dark, Lord God, your light is still greater. And we thank you, Father, that you never stop looking at us. You never stop loving us. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that again together. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my hand I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, the good. 
of the goodness of God. Faithful. Faithful. You are merciful. You are kind. You are an awesome God. You call the sun to rise and you lay it down to rest. You hold this heart of mine and you Oh, King 
kings, you're worthy to be praised. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? King of glory. King of glory. Fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to
Welcome to New City Church. Thank you for joining us. As we continue in today's experience, we have just a few announcements to share with you. Big news alert here! Beginning in the very near future, we will be live streaming our 9 a.m. Sunday service. For those of you who are not yet able to join in person, you can jump in on the online platform and join us live. Once officially launched, the 9 a.m. live stream will take place of our current 6 p.m. online experience. We are so excited to take our online experiences to the next level. Stay tuned for our official live stream launch date. Don't forget, please don't forget to register for this year's virtual hunger walk. Reminder, 100% of the funds raised will go to our City Bridges Food Pantry. This is a huge opportunity for you to support City Bridges. You can access a direct link to the Hunger Walk registration through newcitychurch.net. And join us Sunday, February 28th for our next All-In Gathering. This on-site gathering will be a time of celebrating all God is doing in and through our lives. Water baptisms, baby dedications, communion, worship, the works. It is going to be a life-giving Sunday. If you are interested in registering for water baptism or baby dedications, please visit the all-in page on newcitychurch.net. Generosity is a biblical benchmark value. We are grateful to be a church that is faithful in the area of giving and generosity. If you would like to give today, we have a giving feature in the public chat for those joining us online. And for those physically gathering at our campuses, you can submit your giving online at newcitychurch.net or place your physical tithe in a tithe box found in the foyer. Thank you so much for being a part of New City Church. We hope you enjoy the rest of the experience. God bless you, New City Church. God bless you. We are so excited to be here today with you. Yes. This uh, beautiful day that the Lord has made. As a matter of fact, it's a day of love. So it's a beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, it's Valentine's. We want to celebrate with you today. When, uh, this is my lovely wife, Emily Perez. Hello. Um, also known as the best half. Um, <laughs> or 90% of it, at, at least, I say I'm only 10%, but praise the Lord. Uh, we're really excited to be here today. So we wanted to uh, come and speak to you this, this, uh, this day uh, and this wonderful day of love and speak to you um, regarding the topic of being woven together. Amen. Amen. So um, I'm going to let my wife talk a little bit about us so that you guys can perhaps know who we are. You're probably wondering who are these crazy people up here. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Okay, so <laughs> Winston and I have been married now um, 14 years. We have four beautiful children, um, aging from 22 to 6, and um, he's uh, an associate pastor here, and I am a pastor's wife. <laughs> We love what we do, and God gave us um, a ministry when Maya was six months. So that has to be at least 12 and a half years ago, and it was, it's woven. And woven is just basically ministering 
to marriages and um, strengthening marriages through the Word of God, filtering our marriage through the Word of God. And it's been something that we do out of the passion that we have for marriages and the desire to see marriages win in the church and outside of the church. Amen, amen. So yeah, so um, as we begin, you're going to see that this is going to be a dialogue. It's going to be a conversation between us. So, uh, But uh, we must have the most important tool. So I want you guys to get your Bibles, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Let's get our Bibles, and um, uh, we're going to look at the Word of God in the book of Genesis. Why not start from the beginning? <laughs> right, and let's go to chapter 1, a uh, very common passage there, very common verse, verse 26 through 27, amen, and um, we're going to read the word in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we all say amen. Amen, amen. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him. Male and female, he created them. Amen. So I want to speak to you this morning, and the title, we want to speak to you, um, Woven Together. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, Lord. We thank you, Father, for just allowing us to be here this morning. Father, we are just so thankful uh, that we are able to be here uh, in this wonderful day. Father, I pray that you may be glorified uh, through our lives, Father, that um, as we speak today, that all of us have the ears and the hearts to listen and to receive what you have in store for us today. Be glorified, Father. May your name be exalted. So we give you thanks, Father. Amen. And amen. amen. So, you know, a couple weeks ago, I spoke on the title of the gospel, uh, vertically and horizontally connected. Which was a great message, by the way. Babe. Well, glory to God. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, but yeah, th- thank you for my wife. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'll take it. But, you know, the scripture says clearly here that man was made in the image of God. And that this means that the context of a man is supposed to be uh, or the man is supposed to be God's representative here on earth uh, and through creation, acting as a mirror reflection of God's uh, glory uh, to creation, also creation back to God. So humans are supposed to be a representation of God to one another in this world. Uh, so that means we're, you know, it's giving, uh, giving us a picture of who God really is and what his will is for us. The thing about it is that God relates to us in so many ways, but he uses sometimes pictures or metaphors uh, that will help us better understand what it is that is in his mind and what he's saying to us. We sometimes need that tangibles, uh, that something, uh, you know, that that is clear so that we can understand and experience uh, what God is saying and so that we can understand him. So the Bible is really filled with many images of that. Um, so we're very thankful for that. But it's very clear that God created us, uh, and not to be alone, but he created us for relationship, like I said two weeks ago. And truly, in the beginning, we see how God gave Adam his presence. That was a first relationship, that vertical relationship. And then he said it was not good for the man to be alone. So that was God thinking about Adam. And here we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and where he, he says that, that he gives Adam a helpmate. Because to accomplish the assignment, the task at hand that God had for humanity, he saw that he needed a helpmate. And that was that horizontal relationship. So here's God. God gives Adam Eve. So that's what's important to understand. But relationships, you know, in reality, they're not automatic. They're just not. You know, they, they rather require intentionality. We Absolutely. must be uh, really of a mindset of being intentionally connected. Uh, the mindset of being woven together, especially if you're married, or woven in Christ if you're single, because come on, we got to be woven with Christ. Uh, that, that is your mate until he sends you uh, 
that, uh, you know, knight in shining armor or that, uh, that queen, amen? So God is thinking about us, but we yes. are to be intentionally connected. So how can we be intentionally connected and woven together, babe? So I like that word intentionally connected for the reason that many of us think that relationships should be easy um, and it should require minimal work when the opposite is true. Relationships require intentional actions and uh, words and experiences. So I love that word, being intentional. Yeah. And we have the model. It's in the word. So why not just follow that model? Amen. Follow the model that God gave us for marriage Amen. and the process that we must undergo. That's being intentional. Amen. So that means, so, so we have to follow the model. You're saying follow the model, but also accept the process. Absolutely. And, and I know it's hard for, for all of us to, you know, accept that process, but it is a process. It's not automatic. So uh, here are four keys that, uh, that we want to point out today about this uh, being in intentionally connected, woven together, um, as we were talking about here. Uh, the, the first one that we want to talk about is our relationship with our spouse was intended to mirror the same relationship of Christ and his bride, the church. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, um, I, I know that uh, we most like to read from 22, but we're going to go to 21. Okay, we're going to go to 21, and we're going to read through 32. Amen? Amen. So in Ephesians 5, 21, 32, it says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his wife and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Amen. Amen. So basically, marriage is a representation of Christ. That's what marriage was recreated to glorify God, glorify Christ, glorify the kingdom. So the picture of marriage is an important image that God has given us, and it calls us to a higher understanding of who he is and how we relate to him, how he relates to us, and how we ought to relate to one another. Amen. Amen. So let me ask you this question, babe. Why is there emphasis on the picture of Christ and his bride, the church? Um. Amen. You know, uh, Paul gives us a good insight about this in here in Ephesians 5. And, and, and this chapter particularly, you know, it's not popular with today, uh, especially with today's culture. That's the challenge that we have with it today. When you really read this, this chapter, most people are, don't really favor it. Uh, you know, you talk about it with, in weddings, perhaps, or you discuss it. Uh, in different references of marriages, uh, but it has fallen out of favor, unfortunately, with popular culture today, mainly due to the, the complementary roles, because it describes a husband and a wife's marriage, especially when, when it comes to the idea of a wife submitting to her husband. It is looked at as a negative thing. It's looked as a, a, of a place of control 
or enslavement. That, that is so correct. But, but Paul spends, you know, the latter half of this chapter giving instructions to men and, and obviously to, to the women, describing uh, what their marriage should really be looking like, ending with a quote in Genesis uh, that is originally, originally from Genesis chapter 2 about a man and a woman becoming one flesh in marriage. So then, but then he throws a twist at the end, saying that that doesn't actually have to do with marriage. That's what that last verse really states, at least not ultimately. So, so I want us to get here. So in case we missed it, uh, he's emphasizing by returning to the instructions of what married couples, their assignments, their responsibility, their expectations, but actually marriage is, is, is not what this is fully talking about at the end here of this, uh, of this chapter. So, so what is really the point of what he's describing when we go back uh, here to uh, verse uh, 32? It says, uh, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that this refers to Christ and the church. So a lot of people believe or, you know, automatically looking at this chapter, because of the context of the chapter, you're thinking, well, we're just talking about marriage. But there's a key point here that we must understand. If we really look at marriage, marriage is not eternal. It's not eternal. There is a part when you really look at, obviously you look at it from the place of Christ and his church. But when you talk about my wife and I, the Bible doesn't talk about us together in heaven as a, as a married couple, okay? So, and that's because overall, marriage is not above God. God is always about marriage. The point here is that marriage has a purpose. And it has a purpose here on earth, okay? And that's, that's what we're talking about here. But even though it contains, uh, this chapter contains the instru instructions to the people that are married, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, wives submit to your husband, a husband love your wife, but there's something deeper going on here that Paul is trying to talk to us about that has a higher meaning, okay? So, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, uh, you know, as I've read before, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, so what does it mean to be one flesh? So God has given us a picture here, and our marriage is supposed to be a living picture of Christ and his church. God's love and will for mankind to the world, which is obviously embodied in Jesus. Therefore, our marriage should speak for something deeper than itself. Amen. Like I said earlier, it should, it should glorify our Lord and Savior. And it speaks as a, a representation sorry, of Jesus' love for his people. Amen. So when the world looks at your marriage, they should see Christ. When they look at your marriage, they should see Christ-like love. They should see Jesus because that is ultimately what we're trying to model. And although it's good to have the marriage that Paul describes here, a good marriage is not the main point, as Winston was trying to share earlier. A good marriage, rather, is a signpost pointing us to God. Amen. So our marriage should always point to God. When our children look at us, they should be able to see not only the God in us, but also be able to see scripture being acted out, scripture being worked out in our lives and in our marriage, being lived out, absolutely. So properly functioning marriages, as described in the, in the chapter, helps the world to see God and his love for us. And that is why it is so important to be intentional about working towards a healthy Christ-like marriage. Amen. Amen, that's so good. So they help us relate to God. It also has given us an image, a metaphor, a picture to look at the glimpse of the divine, right? So good marriages gives us a tangible picture of Jesus and his love for the church. This is why the instructions are rooted and grounded in what Jesus has done for us in our relationship with him. That sacrificial act that was um, done on the Calvary, you know, on our behalf. And our marriage is a mirror of that, or at least it ought to be a mirror of that. 
And so we go to Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Love that. Let me read that again. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Marriage was created to be relationship of three. Christ, man, and woman. And I think that oftentimes we forget about that, especially the Christ piece. That is the framework of Godhead. Many describe this framework as a Christ-centered marriage, right? And I want to share a quick experience. Um, during my fast earlier this year, um, I was praying for my children. And, you know, just to try to make a long story short, asking God some questions about why things were occurring the certain way and why was parenting young adults were becoming so difficult now that they're seeing the world and experiencing certain things. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you made it harder than it had to be. And I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean by that, Lord? He said, you were supposed to partner with me in raising your children. And that goes for this marriage as well. I'm supposed to partner with God in displaying a Christ-like healthy marriage. And my husband is to do the same. But oftentimes we do things on our own or we find a Googled concept of what marriage should look like and we run with that. And we dismiss God. So having him the center of our marriage is essential. You know, what, and, I, and I want to bring that back as you mentioned about that because you shared that with me. But one of the key takes that still today um, has impacted me because of what you said with that was that you said um, what God was telling you was, well, if, if, you, if you as a parent was perfect, therefore, in the same token, if you as a wife was perfect, then the other person won't need me. And so that was my question. My, my goal was perfection. And God said, I didn't create you to be a perfect parent. Because had that been the case, you wouldn't need me. So we weren't created to be perfect for one another. We already have that perfect being in our marriage, which is God. Amen. So we don't need to be perfect for one another. We just need to learn how to love each other in a way that glorifies our Father. Undergoing the process. Amen. Amen. So, so what is the a Christ-centered marriage, because obviously we, we hear that so many times uh, along church, uh, but what exactly does it mean? So, one, it starts with mutual devotion to Christ. Me devoted to him, you devoted to him. Amen. And it goes back to my story when, I, when God said you were supposed to partner with him. And he finished off saying, had you partnered with me, your burden would have been lighter and your yoke would have been easier, but you chose to take the hard road. Mm. And so the first few years of our marriage was really tough. Don't remind me. <laughs> Don't remind yes, me. Yes, because it was flesh against flesh. Yeah. yeah. And we yeah. didn't allow room for the spirit. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. You know, uh, the second part of that, number two, uh, for us is... We must surrender to God and surrender to each other. You know, uh, part of the, what we've done with the woven, woven experience, we've covered a very important aspect that first night, what we believe is essential. When you go into the marriage with your own ideas about what marriage should look like, not truly knowing because the reality is you looked at your mama and your daddy, you perhaps looked at your auntie and your uncle, you looked at a brother and sister, and I'm not saying that you cannot glean from those great examples, but they're not the blueprint, right? So what happens is we got to surrender our ideas also of what marriage should look like and really go into the word, look to God and say, Lord, what is my marriage supposed to look like? So it starts with surrendering ourselves to God Absolutely. and surrendering our ideas to God so that then we can surrender to one another. Okay, and we believe that God will have the glory through that process. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of my favorites is practicing sacrificial love. That's a tough one. That is so tough, babe. 
Practicing sacrificial love. What does that look like? I mean, it's easy to love me, though, right? Oh, yeah. So Always. <laughs> but, you know, it is easier now. It wasn't that much. It wasn't always that way, but it is easier now because we've learned how to love one another. Mm -hmm. And I say that because practicing sacrificial love for me was loving my marriage. I had to love my marriage because my husband wasn't always going to be lovable. Mm. So I had to love my marriage and I had to know that my marriage was Jesus. And it was just me doing what I needed to do to glorify Jesus in that. So that with the days when I didn't feel like I liked my husband and the days I felt like I did not love my husband, because mm. unfortunately there were days that way where our marriage was challenged to that point. I loved my marriage enough to fight for my marriage and not fight for him. And so now we're in a place where our love is so profound, but we had to, I had to love marriage in order for us to come into this place. And that was the sacrificial love. Because love, the fairy tale love that we're brought up to believing, isn't a sacrificial love. Yeah. Sacrificial love means staying in it and fighting for it, even when you cannot see what the outcome may be. That is true faith. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Yeah, now that's really good. I thought it was easy to, to, to love me, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is now, babe. <laughs> you know, number four, um, for us, I think, is practicing serving one another. Uh, you know, it's like I said two weeks ago, I think it's impossible for us to really serve God without serving people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if we will look at our spouse and really serve them with the heart of God, with a true heart, pure heart of wanting to please God, through us serving, serving one another. I think God will be incredibly pleased. That will be like a fragrant smell to the Lord for us to be able to give ourselves to our spouse. Because truly, just as, as in the same way you spoke about sacrificial love, you know, for us to do it, uh, I know it's going to cost us. It's also going to require sacrifice for us to be able to serve, uh, serve one another and do it uh, in a way that pleases God. Yes. Yep. Um, we have selfless, but I think selfless does go with that sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, practicing sacrificial love will diminish who you are and increase who Jesus is in you. Yeah. But right. that also requires practicing humility, yeah. which is so difficult when you fear, feel as if you're going toe to toe with your spouse. That's good. To come and humble yourself and say, you know what? I was not right, that was wrong, I apologize. Mm. And humility is such a blessing for marriage. Humility solves so many arguments, disagreements, um, misunderstanding, and I, I, if we've practiced that more, just to humble ourselves, then I think we would avoid so many, um, what we call it, heated uh, fellowship. <laughs> Heated fellowship. It's really WWE MMA. Yes. <laughs> Call it what you want. And um, it is important. And God requires us to practice humility in all relationships, not just marriages, in all relationships. Amen. That's how we grow. Amen. Amen. Uh, the last one out of these, uh, oh, actually, no, there's two more. Sorry about that. Uh, the next one really is practicing forgiveness. Um, you know, we have a component out of uh, the second phase of Woven, uh, intentionally connected, uh, called uh, pardon versus parole. Um, and that is because so many marriages today, unfortunately, uh, you know, they, they go through their struggles. They have their conflicts and they go through their conflict resolution. But unfortunately, many don't truly forgive. And I'm saying they tr truly don't forgive because what happens is uh, something will happen six months, a year down the road, five years down the road. I even heard people 10 years down the road. And uh, s that comes back somehow in the same conversation, bringing those things back. So what that truly looks like, that wasn't really forgiveness. That was really being paroled, okay? So, so they were not pardoned. They were paroled until you did it again or something reminded me of that so that I can come back to that, hold that against you, yes. and not truly forgive. forgive them. 
You know, so there's a difference between uh, paroling somebody and truly pardoning somebody. Pardoning means completely forgetting about it. You know, forget, you know, and I know uh, when we say forget, it's, it's hard to forget, and I get that. But I believe when God heals us and we truly have an intentional action, praying to the Lord and acting as we have pardoned them, I believe God is going to honor that. It's, so, it's more so forgetting the pain yeah. and not the yeah. occurrence. Because the occurrence is our testimony. That's true. And we need that testament to bless other marriages. Yeah. But forget about the pain that it once had on you or that hold it once had on you. Yep. Uh, the last one we are uh, going to share is practicing communication. And remember, there are three in a marriage. Christ, you, and your spouse. So when in practicing communication, it's not just practicing communication with my husband. It's practicing communication with my heavenly father. Ooh, that's good. And what I realized is the way I communicated with him was the way I communicated with him. And I say that because there were times where I would pray to God and I would ask him, you know, for counsel and walk away before I can even get a response. Mm. And that was the same way I would react to my husband. You know, and so my communication with, my, with God was very short and very instantaneously and then go on with the rest of my day. And then that was my communication with my husband. When I learned to truly reverence him and honor him and hold him as head of my life, then I was able to practice those same principles with my husband. So we have to learn to practice our communication not only with our spouse, but with our heavenly father. Amen. So let's continue. How, so how do we continue to really do the legwork to be intentionally connected? What's point number three? So point number three is love grows with the knowledge of God. Mm. And so I'm going to take us to Philippians 1.9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So although we have a basic understanding of love, which we all think we do, mm -hmm. It's depth and endurance and consistency depends on the knowledge of God because God is love. We always have to remember that. Amen. As we grow in our understanding of him and his ways, our love for him deepens as well, demonstrating how to love others. If you want to truly learn how to love others, allow God to love you and learn to love him and he will teach you how to love others. Amen. So, so it's easier, like I was saying, to love you because yeah. my relationship with Christ is so much stronger. Amen. And I know his love for me. Yeah. And therefore, I can transfer that love to you and our children. That's really good. Yeah. So, so the, more, the more I know God, the more I grow in his love, the more yes. I love him. Absolutely. So it should be the same way then. The more I know my spouse, the more I grow in that love for him or her. So I, at least it should. It should be. Right? <laughs> I, I would think yes. it should. Uh, but it requires a very key component, though. And that is the component that nobody likes to deal with. I, I don't. I, it's hard. And it's called time. Time. Let me translate that for you. Time equals process. Right? So that is the, the toughest part. But, but we spoke a, t a while ago. I'm not sure if it was here or just one of our um, uh, chat and chew at, at, with the small group. But we did a, a segment about the five stages of marriages. Yes. And we did that for the purpose of helping marriages identify themselves where they were in that, you know, which stage they were in. Because uh, it really is the reality. You cannot skip from one to the next. I mean, one to all the way to the end. But these are the realities of marriages. Um, so, babe, so the first, well, I, if you want to cover the first one, I guess. Yeah, we can. So what is the first one there? So the first one is the romance stage. Honeymoon stage, you know, <laughs> however you want to call it. But this is when you can't get enough of each other. Neither of you can do any wrong. Mm. Oh, he's just so wonderful. Yes, he left the laundry on the floor again. But oh, he's so cute when he does it, you know. And then, you know, that's what, what we're considered the honeymoon stage yeah. where life is just bliss. 
So that's the second stage is the disillusionment stage. This is kind of the aha moment that they finally woke up one day in the morning and realized, oh my God, what did I do? Mm-hmm. They, they realized that their mate, their spouse is a human <laughs> being, and not just any, an imperfect one, okay? Because I don't want to say anything past that for right now, okay? <laughs> but they recognize the flaws, the shortcomings, right? Uh, this is when one or both of them get too comfortable and think that there's no need for them to no longer have a hot pursuit for one another. For one another. You know, right, Pastor Sean? Hot pursuit, you know? Yeah. Uh, so they get too relaxed. They, they get too relaxed. And, um, and that's what happens on stage number two. So stage three is that power struggle or the battle of the sexes struggle, um, WWE stage, whatever you want to call it, where everything is radioactive. You always find yourself fighting. You always find yourself being competitive and argumentative, and everybody wants to be right. This stage is also known as the disappointment phase or the distress stage. As the characteristics from the disillusionment phase um, intensifies, they become harder and harder to, to deal with, yeah. you know? And so you will most likely begin to pull away from each other at this stage. Mm. And at this point, you both still believe that conflict is a bad thing, which is it, which is it's not. not. That's right. But you are increasingly aware of your many differences. You fight to draw boundaries in a relationship, and as a result, even small annoyances become big issues. Mm. And all marriages go through these stages. That's true. That's true. So stage number four is the stability stage. So this is where you see the value in one another. You know, where it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. You know, yeah, you know instead of trying to be right, I'm going to let this, <laughs> let, let me choose my battles. Let me not get an uppercut. Very wise. Do you get, sorry. So, you know, this is a restful and a peaceful time you know, within a marriage compared to the last stage when you look compared to that. But, but it's also known the friendship phase, right? Um, you know, the sad part about this is not many couples, not many mar- marriages get to this stage, unfortunately. They don't pass uh, the third stage. They believe that at that point of the third stage being so conflicting, so at each other, they want to give it up. And they quit. They quit. And so they don't get to reap the benefits or the fruit mm. of the commitment stage. Say that again. Say that again. Yes. Reap the benefits or the fruit of the commitment stage. Amen. And this stage is also known as the acceptance phase, the transformation stage, or the real love phase, where we see the purpose of God in the marriage, where we focus on pursuing God together, yeah. and uh, that is a pride product of you having a joyful and purposeful marriage. Because, you know, one thing we have to understand is our marriage has a purpose. Amen. And you can, God is able to show you that purpose in this commitment phase. Amen. That's so good. That's so good. So we go to 1 Peter 4, 8, and it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, so, uh, point number four, and this is the last point for intentionally being intentionally connected and woven together, is that God teaches us how to love. Uh, he teaches us how to love our spouse through loving us, through him loving us. So loving your spouse, as I mentioned uh, earlier, really is the visible manifestation of loving God. It really is. You know, here's Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to uh, uh, go into even earlier verses, verse 15. It says, look carefully then how you, uh, carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is the debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, Amen. addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord. Amen. You hear that? So singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then we see, obviously, when he uh, begins talking about um, 
the, the guidance, a clear picture of what it should look like for each of us, what is really the, the, the instructions for us. It teaches us how, how I should love my spouse. And how I should love mine. Yeah, so we, you know, we both have the same needs, but some of our needs are a little more amplified. So Ephesians 5, you know, here's Paul. He gives us the instructions clearly as how we should interact with one another. So he instructs the, the wife to uh, submit to her husband, uh, the husband to, to love uh, their wives as Christ loved the church. Um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 7 elaborates that husband and wives are to show due compassion and thoughtfulness to one another. So, so now we have to understand that these instructions are not meant to, to stand alone. They're not. They require obedience from both participants of the marriage. And it's required in order for this to be successful. So as is commonly said, it takes two to marriage, but it takes one to destroy it. So, Unfortunately, um, that is so, so true. to see the perspective intended in this passage, we must consider Jesus' passion. So, uh, so what is that passion that Jesus showed us, showed us through this passage? Jesus submitted himself to the church. See, he left his splendor, church. He left heaven. He left the right hand of the Father, came down to heaven, spent 33 years. He endured. And he got out of his place of majesty just so that he can save his bride. Yes. Now that's complete submittance to the church. So what is that second point there, babe? He endured torture and ultimately gave his life on the cross to give his bride eternal life. And although we're not expected to endure torture because it was already done on the cross, God's given us that already. But we are expected to endure that's what love is. When you go to 1 Corinthians, it shares that you are to endure because it shows not only your commitment to your spouse, but your commitment to Christ. Mm. We are loving, imperfect people who are attempting to live more Christ-like lifestyles. So there's going to require grace and endurance. Yeah, no, that's really good. So this example set um, by Christ, by Jesus, it, it gives us the perfect picture of love. You know, so it's not that, oh, I don't know how to love my, 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 my wife or my husband. Uh, you know, the perfect picture is set. You know, you know, that's what we talk so many times that the expectation has been set. You know, when you look at it, there's really nothing else in terms of expectation that we should set. It's all set there. You know, the Bible is very clear if we can just follow that expectation. Absolutely. Also, we have love is fulfilled when we deny the things that we desire mm. for the best interest of our spouse. And that goes in line with sacrificial love, okay, and selflessness. Um, but oftentimes, we're so gun ho about what it is that we want, we practice selfishness. You know, a marriage is, in order for a marriage to be biblically based, spouses must learn to sacrifice. And again, the model is in the Bible. And sacrifice not only grows your marriage, it grows you individually, and it grows you, again, close, closer to Christ. Amen. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice to deliver reconciliation and forgiveness to the world in need of both. And due to Jesus' sacrifice, a true believer in him, once converted, sacrifices their life to serve him. And that's what marriage should look like. Marriage requires two spouses that will sacrifice for each other. That's good. In marriage, we must always be willing to do without so our spouse can have. Most often we think in a physical sense, but it is commonly more on a egotistical struggle. Mm, that's usually the case. let down our pride, right? Yeah, that's usually Because our same. pride can creep in and destroy the relationship yeah. between a man and a woman. So true sacrifice is when spouses are quick to reconcile and forgive. Amen. That's really good. So, you're, you know, so, you know, we often say your relationship with God will reflect your relationship with others. Absolutely. Your relationship with God should reflect, you know, your relationship with your spouse. Uh, it's not easy. You know, I know I said this um, to message, uh, a message ago, but really, you know, you got to love God so that you can love yourself so that you can love your spouse. 
You know, you, you've got to really undergo that process. The love, believe me, this, you know, we, we've spoken so many times about love, and it is not that lovey-dovey feeling. It ain't that. You know, uh, love truly comes from a place of being committed. It's not an easy thing, but it only originates from God. So, um, you know, babe, as we talk about these point of being intentionally connected, and we spoke about even the process or the stages of marriage, Um, where do you think we are today in terms of what stage are we in? I think we're in a commitment stage. It took a minute, but we're there. Amen. (laughs) Yeah, I I think I was between, you know, that uh, and and stage number four, and I think, you know, uh, uh, definitely God has has carried us to our process. Um, But Let's, let's, let's get deeper into the reality of our process. Okay, okay? let's do it. Um, uh, we like to teach through our um, goods and our bads, if that's okay. So what was the happiest moment uh, that you would consider in our marriage and why? Um, the happiest moment in our marriage is when... You came to me and you basically said, I'm going to love you as my sister in Christ. Mm. Because I realized that I am more gracious Mm. to my brothers and sisters in Christ than I am Mm. to you. I remember that. And that just transforms my entire life with you, my marriage, and it was one of the sexiest things you did, by the way. Thank so. you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No. And it stays with me. Yeah. I appreciate that. And that's, that was one of those revelations to me, too, that um, so, many, so many times we give so much grace to everybody else. You know, I know I share this even about my children. We give so many grace to the people we disciple, the people we collaborate with, but to our own children, our spouse, we don't give that same amount of grace. And, and, and truly it was a revelation for me. And I was looking at this the wrong way. You know, I, I, I was thinking, that's my spouse first. No, 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 that, that's my sister in Christ first. And the moment I had that revelation from the Lord, really, that's when I started, you know, I had to like, you know, ball crying, the ugly cry, I realized, yeah, man, I messed I this thing up. <laughs> you know, so. So let me ask you, what character of Jesus you mostly wish you had? Man, um, you know, truly when I look at the relationship between Christ uh, and his bride, the church, Christ has been the perfect example of a true sacrifice, of true being selfless, of enduring abuse through time, and I know as humans, we become so reactive. I, I've looked back um, at our journey, look at so many times where I unfortunately gotten out of character simply because of I allowed my emotions to get the best of me. Mm-hmm. You know, I will never forget, you know, back in Stone Mountain. And, you know, I, I'm going to be real with you guys. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, you know, this may be a little too personal with y'all, but that's the only way we know how to teach. But I was so upset about a question that my wife asked that I stopped the car. Um, and I, I, pulled, I pulled over to a parking lot. Kroger's parking lot. And I was so upset over it that I grabbed my wife's glasses threw it on the ground. Still to this day, I know that she's forgiven me. I know that God has forgiven me. But just to look back at your life, look at the stupid stuff you've done, you mean like, Lord, how could I do such a thing? And sometimes we got to really be reminded that if it isn't with his help, we just can't do it. We will just, you know, muck it up, as some people say, really just mess things up. Um, and that truly is the one thing that I wish um, that I had, you know, of Christ. Endurance, you know, being selfless, truly, you know, being a more of a grace giver rather than sometimes allow the me, 
you know, we're focusing on me so much that I forget the whole purpose. So, and um, sorry, amen. <laughs> so, um, what has been the biggest mis? Uh, well, actually, that you asked me that question. No, that's your question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what has been the biggest mistake you have made in marriage? So I grew up in, with both parents in my households. My grandparents were married. My great-grandparents were married. Great so divorce was really a taboo. It wasn't something that we experienced much of at all growing up as a child. And I think one of the biggest mistakes I made in our marriage is allowing that notion to even be an option. Mm when things got really tough. And I remember, you know, feeling like, this is it, you know, I'm, I'm just ready to just escape. And as soon as the words of divorce came to my mind, the Holy Spirit stopped me right there and said, how about you divorce your stinking thinking? How about you divorce your pride? How about you divorce mm. your filthy mouth, you know? She and preaching. so she preaching when right now. he said, I bet you, he said, I have no doubt that it, when you divorce those things, your marriage will be okay. And so I said, <laughs> you know, I never thought about that word again because I don't need another one of those beatings from the Holy Spirit. So divorce is really not an option anymore. <laughs> Woo. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, um, so let's, let's go a little further here. So what would be three successful keys to communication that you would say uh, are important in a marriage? Three successful keys of communication, um, honesty and transparency. Mm. And um, the person receiving, you know, what is being communicated Listening with a intent to heal mm. as opposed to defend. Oof. I like that. Mm. Okay. And what would be the three keys um, to a successful marriage? Hmm. For me, um, I believe one of the key areas that God has worked in my life was to look at marriage differently. And everything changed when I, instead of focusing so much on this, and I know this is going to sound counterproductive, I, I know, I, I was so adamant about this, you know, focus so much on this, her and I, that I missed out an understanding that truly I had to focus on God and his assignment. And if I would just be obedient to what God has set as the expectation for me as a husband, and I would just do that, the byproduct would be a joyful marriage. Now, I'm not saying it won't be without its challenges, but in reality, when you ask us when's the last time that we had a heated or fellowship or whatever you want to call it, it's been years, yeah. okay? We, we just don't have it. Now, is, has, you think we, hasn't been have, uh, we haven't had some sort of contention? No, we have them in terms of, you know, seeing things differently, but we just don't react the same way, okay? Because we, we, we see the value in one another, but we also uh, have been uh, tactful in understanding that marriage is also a skill set. It is. Okay? It's a skill set. You got to understand timing. You got to understand how to communicate properly. You know, all these different, very important things that helps us have a very important, uh, a successful marriage. Um, communication, I think it's key. Uh, that's one of the things that I think many miss. Yes. They don't communicate uh, well, uh, effectively. It's not just talking. It's not just communicating. It's communicating effectively. Um, and um, lastly, I would say, you know, to me, I think growing in long suffering. It's just part of what uh, we have to understand and undergo as people of God. So, so yeah. yeah. I like those so, words. so yeah. So, you know, these are in reality um, our process, and we wanted to share with you that process because it's important for you to take into context what we've been talking about. The reality is that we must be intentionally connected, and in order for us to be intentionally connected, we have to be obedient to what God has already set. 
Okay, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. That many marriages look differently, yeah, I, I, we understand that, but they must have the same foundation. It must be the Word of the God. Word of God. Absolutely. So we like to pray with you today. And your marriages. And your marriages, and pray that God will, uh, will use this as a tool to be able to help you in your process uh, of marriage. It's not just following the, and being obedient to God, but also accepting his process of marriage. Amen? So let's Amen. pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks, Lord, and we thank you for just allowing us we've come together. Father, we pray, Lord, that uh, as we have spoken your word, that this word will resonate with our hearts today. Father, I pray that you help every couple out there that feels that, that they, they're, they're at the last straw. Uh, they're the ones that, Father, are thinking that, you know, they just need to call it quits. Father... We declare, Father, healing. We declare that they can see themselves through your eyes, Father, that they can win, that they can endure. But more importantly, Father, that you can heal their marriage. You can heal their marriage, God. If they will only follow the steps that you have placed, Father, in front of them, Lord God. So, Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Father, for an intervention of the Holy Spirit. That, Father, your Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of each one of them. That, Father, that you bring conviction, that you bring repentance, acknowledgement, God. A tender heart to receive, oh God. And a heart, Father, that is committed to the assignment and the purpose of marriage. That, Father, through their marriage, that you may be glorified. The lives, Father, will be changed. That this world will get a glimpse of God through them, God. The Father, that you will use them as a vessel, as an instrument, Father, to touch, Father, generations to come in their families and around them. Use them, Father, mightily. Father, I pray for your healing upon them. I pray for peace, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we pray and hope that you have been blessed yes. by this segment. We love you, and please be intentionally Connect it. God bless you. God Love bless. you. We hope you enjoyed the message today and really take it to heart and let God speak to you further. Hey, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to partner our faith with yours. Right there in the public chat, there is a prayer feature that you can click and it'll connect you with our prayer hosts that are ready to pray with you. And if you would like to give your life to Christ today and place your faith in him, there's also a salvation feature right there in the chat. We'd love to journey with you as you begin your walk with Christ and we can pray with you through that as well. If you have any other questions or need any other information, go to newcitychurch.net. NCC, thank you for joining us today. We love you and we hope to see you soon.